you go to start a, a business and then all of a sudden, the more your business grows, the less and less and less you actually get to do any of that stuff that you really love doing. And it's why you started the business. Hey, welcome back to another episode of HVAC Success Secrets Revealed with uh, Thaddeus and Evan. And well, uh, you probably saw in that image that it is no Evan. It is just me uh, rocking her solo today. Evan is down in New Orleans or New Orleans, uh, depending on how you like to say it. Uh, he is at the Service Titan Marketing for the Trade Summit, uh, giving a message, I believe, tomorrow on the future state of SEO. So excited to see his uh, recording from that a little bit later. Maybe we'll spin it and put it up on our podcast networks for those to see. Um, but Today, we have on no stranger to the world, Chris Hunter uh, from a uh, few different roles uh, he's had in the past. He's currently a director of customer relations at Service Titan. He's also the co-owner of GoTime Success Group. But he also started Hunter Heating and Air in 2006, which is now called Hunter Super Techs. Probably heard of it. They've got five locations. He exited that business in 2018 and really uh, diving into the GoTime Success Group, the director of relations uh, customer relations at Service Titan. You know the the thing that I like about what it what he was talking to me about before is they take he basically taking a customer and planting them into the platform, and he's basically an owner that's helping other owners. But one of the fascinating things is he gets to see the data, study the data to see what the best of the best are doing in order to be able to replicate success in their business. I'm excited to dive into that topic. Um, there was another topic that I was going to pull up, but I closed the wrong window. So now I don't have it in front of me because, hey, you know what? When you're running solo, sometimes shit happens. But it's uh, going to be a fascinating episode. A couple of the topics, um, selling a business and what it's like on the other side and the emotional raw impact of that. I'm going to look forward to that conversation. I think a lot of people are going to hear that. A couple other the highlights of things that we hopefully get time to get towards and get to key strategies and optimizing operational excellence, profitability, and custom relations, recruitment and retention strategies for contractors, navigate the skilled labor shortage. But he also ran his business in 2009. Um, so uh, through 2009. So we know what happened there. We know what's happening in 2024. So it's going to be a good topic. But today's show would not be possible without these guys on the top of the screen, Elite Call Chirp and On Purpose Media. Um, let's go ahead and start with Chirp. So you want to transform your home service business with Chirp, the ultimate automation toolbox, capture more leads, connect and skyrocket your sales. Chirp integrates seamlessly with platforms like Service Titan, House Call Pro, offering on uh, automated text, emails, and even the ringless voicemails. You want to boost your Google reviews and customer loyalty with our proven rehash program. You know, if you schedule your demo with them today, you can get 25% off your first three months at chirp.com forward slash HSSR. Uh, the other company, Elite Call, not, not not really the other company. Jack is phenomenal individual. I had a call with him actually just before the podcast. So Elite Call um, is, uh, have you ever thought about outbanding your databases to fill your dispatch boards with lucrative savers and sales appointments and boosting memberships too? Well, enter in Elite Call. They are a U.S.-based call center that does just that. For over 20 years, their dedicated teams don't just make calls. They directly integrate appointments into your CRM and fill your dispatch board. Don't let your competition get ahead. Let Elite Call connect with your customers first. Visit them at EliteCall.net today. And last but certainly not least, us, On Purpose Media. We are uh, your ability to enhance our online, online presence with On Purpose Media, your go-to home service marketing experts for everything web design, SEO, and PPC. And we got stunning user-friendly websites. We've got increased visibility on your search traffic, and we've got targeted traffic through effective pay-per-click ads. So let's turn your online presence into a lead-generating powerhouse. Visit onpurposemedia.ca today to start your digital transformation and watch your home service company thrive. Without further ado, we'll be back on the other side with Chris Hunter. Four, three, two, one. Welcome to HVAC Success Secrets Revealed, a show where we interview industry leaders and disruptors, revealing the success secrets to create and unleash the ultimate HVAC business. Now your hosts, Thaddeus and Evan. Well, hello, hello. Welcome on the other side of the world uh, in AKA our um, StreamYard space. Um, so that was a lovely intro. So, you know, it's a little bit more difficult doing that by yourself. <laughs> I'm impressed, man. My gosh, you nailed that thing. Yeah? I was out of breath just watching you. So uh, yeah. good. <laughs> I've been doing Wim Hof breathing. So my breathing is my lung capacity is really huge right now. So, uh, but anyways, that's another topic for another day. Welcome to the show. Thank you for taking some time out of your, out of your busy day. Uh, to sit and chat with us and spread some knowledge to the listeners of HVAC Success Secrets Revealed. So 
I always like to start off with the easy layup question. Walk us through your start into the industry and your journey. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So it's probably like, a, like a lot of people, uh, completely by accident. I had no intention of doing HVAC at all. Uh, in fact, it was my senior year in high school and I thought, you know, I just want an easy half a day. So I'm going to take this HVAC class and get to go to the Votech and spend half a day away. And then I'd come back and play baseball and take like one other class. And I did that and I thought, oh, okay, it's pretty cool. Never thought I'd use it. Fast forward uh, several years later, I'm actually working at a job for AT&T and they were going to lay off 10,000 people and I was one of them. So it, luckily there was this guy that was going to retire that did HVAC and they said, man, if you could pass this test, you could save your job. You can have this role. So uh, lo and behold, thank God I remembered a few things. Uh, so I went and I took the test, passed somehow. I don't even remember how now. And the next day they, they said, all right, you're hired uh, or you get to keep your job. Here's a credit card and a truck. You take care of all the commercial systems in southeastern Oklahoma. And I went. I, I remember, this is how out of practice I was. I remember having to uh, call the guy before and like, hey, what? which one is the blue hose hooked to and which one is the red hose hooked to? And uh, he had to he had to school me on that. And then after that, I become a study man. I was a student of the game. I I read and consumed everything I could. Learned how to be the best tech that I could. And then uh, fast forward into starting a business. I did the same thing there. I didn't know a thing about it, but I went and I learned from all the best that I could. And I had a lot of really great mentors. And I uh, just tried to consume everything I could. And then took took action on it. So that was mm -hmm. it. <laughs> well, and, it, and it's funny because sometimes when people do get into to running their own business, they, they had no desire to do it in the first place. They just stumbled upon it or stumbled upon a particular niche or an industry and, and started working on it. Now here they are and they just love everything that they do. But if you well, wanted to, 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 to back up to that, okay, you didn't know a single thing. And I, and I think this is pretty common. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with this at all. And so I'm going to, I'm just going to make sure that when I say this, I'm not, I'm not calling anybody out. Um, a lot of times we start business, we don't have a fucking clue what we're doing, right? Yeah. Uh, like there's, we're like, I'm going to start a business. You're like, I, and then you move into the first steps and you just figure shit out. Right. Um, in going back to that though, if you're to go back in time, shit, almost 18 years, uh, and start your business all over again with the knowledge that you know, now, what are two things that you would have done differently when you first started? Wow. Yeah. So, but let, let me, before we even get to that part, well, I would have done different. Think about this. Think about most people that come through the trades through as being a technician. You love what you do. You're really good at fixing a problem. You're, you're great with maybe sales and the customer aspect of it. Uh, and and I, I love that part of it. I love getting in the truck, going out, meeting new people, doing things like that, serving well. And then you, you go to start a, a business and then all of a sudden, the more your business grows, the less and less and less you actually get to do any of that stuff that you really love doing. And it's why you started the business. So, it, you know, now you're doing things like trying to figure out marketing and pay-per-click and insurance stuff and, you know, payroll, my God, and taxes. I mean, all this stuff that you have no idea uh, really uh, about that you have to start to learn. It was like learning a whole new career. So for me, if I was to go back and do something totally different right off the bat, uh, it would be exactly what I did a few years into it. I, I would have started uh, day one by going and finding the best mentors that I could, learning what they did that made them successful, and tried not to reinvent the wheel. I would have just replicated that. Now, right now, it's obviously integrating the, the right software, uh, getting the right people on your team, and uh, getting a head start like that. But that's that's what I would do. Mm. In it, like mentors are great. Um, and having that conversation or even just masterminds for that matter. Like I yeah. got added to one uh, in WhatsApp yesterday with a bunch of other uh, agency owners in um, other, it, not necessarily agents, just business owners. Right. And some of them have eight figure brands and some of them have seven figure marketing companies. Uh, even like the conversations that are already happening within 24 hours are phenomenal because you can help learn. Uh, you can teach something and, and you can learn something from others. Um, if somebody were to be like, okay, well, I need to find a mentor. <laughs> Don't yeah. even again. What questions do I ask? How do I find one? How do I find the ones right for me? What direction would you point them in? Oh, it's easy. Just go on Facebook. There's all kinds of great mentors out there that'll promise the, the world to you, right? It's it's that simple, isn't it? 
I don't know, but, but yeah. <laughs> or do we do we get it's, into that conversation? I don't think we'll. Yeah, we gotta. Maybe we should stay away from the word gurus and influencers. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's it's fun out there, right? But uh, I mean, my my biggest advice for for finding a mentor, and it doesn't. And a lot of people are like, hey, if they weren't in the business, if they haven't accomplished this, uh, they can't be a mentor. I, I would disagree with that. I think you need a team of mentors. You know, the the saying is, you're the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. Well, I believe this is the same for your your mentorship. You know, you, you can be uh, the average of the five people you're learning the most from. And so for me, I would definitely look for someone with character, somebody that uh, had the right values and the, the, the whole core value system that align with mine. Because if not, everything you learn and try to implement uh, could easily come crashing down on you, right? If it's not built with a set, steady foundation. But And then two, I would definitely go find those that have already been exactly where I wanted to be. Um, why not? You know, the fastest way to get from point A to B is a straight line. So why in the world would I want to try to figure this thing out by going sideways and forward and backwards two steps? And why not go to already point B right there and say, hey, all right, what do I need to do to get right here? So I figure big part of that is that. And then the last part is what you said. Uh, um, it, it's maybe you know, someone not even in the industry. This is why me personally, I, I joined the John Maxwell organization. Mm. It was all about leadership. I wanted to figure out, man, I need to, I need to learn to lead people. You know, this is a people business. Uh, how do I do that better? How do I communicate better to them? How do I figure out how to attract them and grow them and keep them here? So it was some, I had to go to that organization, started learning from them and they, they knew nothing about HVAC, but that was okay. So I, I think you gotta, you gotta choose several, uh, like I said, and, and, you, and, the other thing is I think you don't want to go while several, a small circle is good. If you try to listen and follow the advice of many, uh, you're just going to confuse yourself. That's why I think if you start with the value system, find people that have been exactly where you are or where you want to go. And then third is the, the whatever you're missing as far as the leadership, maybe it's another mastermind that's a specific area of marketing or growth or finances, whatever it is. Uh, try to try to put that in your mentorship small circle. Mm -hmm. Well, and success leaves clues, right? And that's the biggest yeah. thing. And so, and business is business is business almost across any other industry. A lot of the similarities, I and mean, yeah, there's different nuances, sure, um, per per industry, but a lot of it's the same. You know, the, the thing that I liked is be careful of the advice of many. You want to be yeah. careful of groupthink because groupthink can paralyze somebody. You get too many opinions and too many hands in the pot. Well, now you don't know what to do. Or if you have a few or even one person that's really good at this area, one person that's really good at this area, another person that's good at this area, but not being scared to ask them the questions is the key impactful piece. Man, that's a great, that's a great point. I, in fact, I was guilty of doing this to my team without even realizing it. So I, I wanted the best for them. I would bring in all kinds of trainers and we were part of a, a best practice organization, Service Nation Alliance, and it was phenomenal at the time. And you could pick several different uh, trainers, you know, that you wanted to learn from. I thought the more the better. But then I realized, oh my gosh, I'm just confusing the heck out of my technicians. One week I'm training them how to do this system. The next week it's doing this system. What we really needed to do was, yeah, we needed to learn from a few, but establish our system and then hold them accountable and keep training on that system as well. So, uh, yeah, guilty of too many. And it, it definitely uh, just confuses your whole team. Right. Well, it, good, good point to bring up. And, you know, it's one that I never really I mean, thought I mean, you can overtrain. Right. And it's in that's that's a caution. Right. But I mean, you, you also mentioned develop your own system. Right, taking what works for from somebody and leaving the rest aside. Right, taking um, from somebody that uh, is out there doing great things, and you might not like all of it, but you can take a couple things you can learn from that, and you can put that into your business. What are in in looking at that? And I kind of want to go a little bit deeper on this training topic in this overtraining aspect of things, um, and I think it almost kind of blends into what I mentioned earlier about recruitment and retention strategies. Um, for, for skilled labor and making sure that you're doing training the right way. What are some common, I mean, one of them, obviously overtraining, right? What are some other common pitfalls that people are making when it comes to training? Yeah, well, and, and so I'm, I'm a partner in GoTime Success Group. So I've got the kind of the bird's eye view of seeing uh, phenomenal trainers and they get people in the class and I hear the feedback and try to try to measure and see what they're, what they're doing, how the, how the students are taking it. 
And, and when we say overtrain, I, I don't think you can overtrain, but what I mean is um, pull in too many different voices of training, you know, instead of uh, finding one system and continuing to train and improve on it. Uh, for example, we have uh, different classes down at, down at GoTime. Most of them are based on uh, a technical ability. So we're teaching something technical, not just a sales ability, because we believe that, you know, if you can, I know as a technician, if I can fix something or if I have the confidence in my technical ability, well, that confidence brews over into my sales side, right? So at GoTime, we teach the technical side. We teach the customer side where we're teaching how to relate to the customer. And then obviously uh, the sales side. But what happens is we, we see tech, well, technicians and comfort advisors come in that have went to numerous other trainings. And then they get confused. They're like, hey, am I supposed to do, uh, you know, so-and-so says to do it this way. You guys are teaching this way or another group taught this way. What's right? And, and essentially, uh, they're all right. It's just a matter of which one fits the best for what you're trying to accomplish at that, uh, you know, in that system or in that uh, company and implementing it and just keep making it better. You know, so that that's one big pitfall that we see is just too many voices. Uh, mm -hmm tend to confuse a team. And the, the next one is not being consistent with it. You know, and I think we're all guilty of this where we'll send people to a training and then uh, think, okay, yep, check the box. They're trained. They're, they're awesome. They're good. Well, here's how the light went on for me, how I kind of realized, uh oh, there's more to this. I, I had, before I was a partner in go time, I actually hired uh, the lead instructor to come up to my shop and he trained all of our technicians. And it was on static pressure and airflow diagnostic, phenomenal class, right? And, and we went through that thing and it was, it was really, really awesome. And then after, uh, I thought, okay, but a week or two after, let's see how well everyone really comp comprehended or are they still doing it? So I had them start sending me videos of them actually doing these tests. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, almost all of them did really well, but there were a few that were completely lost. So if I wouldn't have known that by following up and measuring and seeing, hey, did they retain it? Do they still need some coaching? Do they need some more help? I would have just checked the box and said, yep, they're trained. We're good to go. We know how to check stack pressure. We can fix ducts. No problem. That wasn't necessarily the case for all. So, uh, you know, I, there's I, I say all the time, you know, what gets measured and recognized gets repeated and improved. Mm -hmm. So you cannot forget the, the measure and the recognized part of it, or it won't get repeated or improved. Right. And, and, and sometimes it's just as it's, it's literally that simple, right? Like, Hey, did this stick with you? Right. Or giving That's a spot it. test. Right. And, and having those, those questions and having ongoing dialogue and asking, being transparent enough to be able to ask your team, Hey, did, did this make sense to you? Do you have any questions? Right. And following up doing ride alongs as well after to hold on, on that, that accountability piece for the training. So that's it. Yep. Yeah. Um, in terms of, of utilizing training for retention techniques, now, obviously on job training and making sure that they have all the tools necessary to be able to complete what they need to complete. That's any business should have that in there. But when it comes to retention techniques with inside of a business, what are some ways that people can leverage? perhaps some alternative or different types of trainings versus just the technical, uh, the, the, the customer facing and the sales types trainings. Are there other things that you've seen to be able to master retention? Yeah. So, I mean, if you think about why, why does a, why does somebody stay at a company, right? And, and there's really three big areas. Uh, and there, I'm a huge fan of the Gallup organization. You know, I look at all their research as far as, you know, why are, why are people staying at jobs? Why are they not? There's a scary stat out there right now that says, 51% of the workforce is actively looking for another job. Mm -hmm. And if that don't scare the pants off of you, I don't know what will, because I mean, my goodness, it's hard enough to get them in here. So we have to develop some time to, uh, or, or learn what's going to keep them here and how do we help them? And, and number one is they want, they want to work for a better boss. You know, they want a good leader at their company. So this is why if you're a company owner, manager, even an aspiring manager, you should be trying to sharpen your leadership uh, ability. You know, you, you got to invest in yourself for this this part because ultimately it's going to come down to uh, do they like who they work for? Because if they don't, they're going to be out of here. Mm -hmm. The next one is is where the training comes in. I think if 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 a, if an employee is not being developed or they're not uh, think they are 
provided with the tools to help them grow their income, their family, their career path, they're going to find someone else that will or find another place that will. Um, Service Titan recently did a, a, a residential contractor report and it, it asked the question, hey, do you plan to um, raise any of your technician salaries over the next year? And it, it was crazy. Uh, in fact, let me see if I can find the exact number. I think it was 20, uh, let's see here, 20, yeah, 23% of all those surveyed, there was a thousand contractors surveyed, 23% of them were not going to do any improvements in, in pay for the next mm -hmm. year. So there's a quarter already, they're checking out, uh, 20% after that was only going to do like a 1% increase. So if, if, if you're not, uh, the pay is table stakes. You got it. You got to invest uh, and pay them what they're worth. But to the training part of it and helping them grow, if you're doing a performance type pay, which I highly recommend that you do, the more you invest into them with training, the better they feel about it, the more confidence they have. And guess what? The more money they make. And you didn't just have to keep up in the ante on them. You help them grow and, and achieve what they want. And, and the other part of the whole uh, performance aspect there is, I, I'm a huge believer in, in figuring out what do people want to actually accomplish? You know, what, what's their goals? What's their bucket list? And, and have a process to identify this. Um, and, and once you get it at, at Hunter, we had it up on the wall. We had everybody's uh, work goals, personal goals, and their bucket list. And guess what? Me as the leader, I spent a lot of time looking over all of those things. And anytime that I could help connect the dots between what they wanted and back to our work or our company mission, that's where the gold happened, you know, because then I could say, hey, man, if we can send you this training, we can help improve your your airflow uh, skills. You're going to end up selling more. You can hit that this revenue or this income goal you want. You can put that money down on your house you want. Let's set a goal. Let's make this thing happen in six months. And bam, now we're now we're working together. They're growing. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the last thing is, I think they want to work at a company. All the data shows it actually means something, right? I mean, are, are you working for uh, someone that's just all, all they're concerned about is the numbers? Or are you working for somebody that wants to genuinely, you know, give back to the community and grow the company and grow the employees and and make it a better place, you know, to work at? So that's that's my take on why why they want to be there. What's going to keep them there? Those three things. We got a a better boss personal growth and you got to work for a company with a, a bigger vision or someone that means something. Oh, it's a higher why, you know, that end part, right? It's it, when you're bigger than something that's part of yourselves, you feel validated and you feel like it's worthwhile to keep pursuing what you're doing. But I like the middle piece about the, it's, it's essentially a dream board. When you walk through with your employees and your team members to be able to find out, okay, what actually lights you up in your personal life? How can I help you fulfill and help I get you those things in your personal life? And I think somebody that's really mastered is Tommy Mello in terms of what he does yeah. in his organization and how he takes care of his people and what he pays them. Now, some people are like, well, I can't afford to pay them. Well, it's because your pricing is shit and you should probably yeah. look at rever rever uh, revising your pricing to be able to take a look at that. But the biggest one is yourself and taking that look in that mirror. At a certain point in an organization's journey, now it becomes about developing leaders leading leaders inside of an organization. And I think that's a really tough thing for a lot of people to be able to do. If you were to make a trans, cause you've made the transition from, you know, leading yourself and your business to leading others, to leading leaders. What is the, the, the biggest challenge in growing that leadership base to get the buy-in to match your vision for your business? Yeah. I mean, so, the, the biggest challenge, one, uh, even making the transition is generally if, if, if you've got to that position of success, you have a lot of talent yourself. Right. So you, you're you're pretty good at doing specific things. So learning to step back, let others think and figure things out, even if you know or you think you know what the answer is, you know, empowering them to actually think, do, do uh, critical thinking to solve problems and come up with ideas and, and then empowering them to actually act on it. And, and before you know it, uh, you, you've got this culture of, hey, they're, they're willing to think for themselves, grow uh, and take action without you having to approve every little thing or come up with every answer. That's the most freeing to me uh, when a 
company leader can actually do that, um, that's when they get set free uh, for sure. So mm -hmm. uh, the other part is, I mean, the, the, if you go and look and you have visited with thousands of business owners at this point, and you can see there's something noticeably different about those shops that have great leadership. And, and all it is, John Maxwell says, all it is is influence. It's, it's nothing more. It's nothing less, but to influence people, you know, they got to respect you. Uh, and, and they got, you got to empower them to, to act and do what you hired them to do. But you can't do this if you don't have a great onboarding process to figure out, Hey, are we bringing in the right people? Have we got the right value system in line? All these skills that we can teach, but are we bringing in the right people? Then let's train them. Then let's release them, mm -hmm. you know, to do their job. Well, uh, it's funny that you mentioned, I'm listening to a book right now, um, on audible and I'm going to pull up the name. So I have it correct. Um, never lose an employee. Uh, great book. Uh, and they talk and they literally just finished the first part about the onboarding process and how you, uh, I mean, now they're talking interviews, uh, and they're going to probably go into deeper onboarding, but when you have that continuity, when you actually train them, you actually give them the information and, and look, we've seen this in our organization where we're like, okay, onboarding call is done. It was three hours. Bye. Have good luck. Right now. Yeah. It's like, well, shit. <laughs> Now we've developed a, a more meticulous onboarding program where we're giving them a lot more tools. And now you start to see them have the ability to have that success, right? But the one word that I like that you said is empowering, not delegating, empowering. I mean, delegating is part of it, but when you empower yeah. your team to be able to make decisions, that's where that really, that key thing becomes in. And, and it's a very tough thing, myself included, to let go of control to be able to allow them to make a decision and be able to let them go forward with that decision and allow a mistake to potentially happen with the decision that they made, even though you might be able to already see the mistake that might be happening, right? That mindset is tough to, to, to overcome. How would you explain that to somebody in a way that they can be like, okay, I see this, but I still just can't let go of that. Yeah. What would you tell well it's simple. You can have growth or you can have control, but you can't have both. You know what I mean? So if you want to, if you want to grow, you're going to have to relinquish uh, the the reins and the control of this situation. And you talked about, you know, you, you said you can maybe sometimes see some mistakes or a failure. I'm a fan of failure. I mean, let them, let them fail. You know, if, if they're trying and they fail, I will, I will support them a hundred percent all day long. It's when you rush in and you rescue them every single time, they're going to start to rely on that. But if they fail and they come back to you like, all right, good swing, buddy. So let's figure out what we got to do now to keep going forward. And then they can critically think to learn to solve problems and, and overcome that man, it's going to make them that much stronger. They're never going to make that mistake again. I mm -hmm. promise you that. Uh, and, and it'll just keep going. It'll get stronger. But if you don't let them build that, uh, that fortitude, right. I mean, that, that, that resilience, uh, man, you, it's, it's going to be a tough road. Same mm -hmm. way with raising, raising kids, right. You got to let them, you got to let them fail a little bit every once in a while to, to figure out how to overcome that and come back swinging again. Right. They, uh, I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old, both boys. And we uh, tell the three-year-old all the time, is that a safe decision? No. I'm like, should you do it? Yeah, I'm like, okay, but uh, <laughs> doing dangerous things safely, right? Um, which yeah. is the key thing. So uh, I want to I want to jump into uh, the data that you see in the success thing, leaving clues, and also talking a little bit about consumer sentiment in 2024, what you went through in 2009 um, from that. But first, the random question generator, one of the favorite parts of my show, of the show, my show. <laughs> it oh, is my show. Evan's not here. Yeah. Evan's not oh, here. Yeah. It is my show. It's your show today. Uh, <laughs> Um, so the random question January is brought to you by on purpose media, where we turn clicks in the clients faster than you can say conversion optimization three times, uh, fast, try to say that three times fast, like a tongue twister. So I tell you, I, I ask you if you want question one, two or three, you don't get to actually know what it is, uh, until you say question one, two or three, and I'll read it out. And it has absolutely, I've, I'm reading them right now and they are, <laughs> uh, I really hope you choose the one specific number on this. Cause, uh, I think it's a hilarious question. So All first right. question you want me to read out one, two, I'm one. ready, man. I mean, I'm thinking if you ain't first, you're last. So number one, let's go with what it. About, what about what Scott's saying? Number two. I like a good number two. So, I mean, that's hard, to, you know, hard not to do that, but yeah, I'm going to go number one. Oh, number one. All right. So sorry, Scott. Um, <laughs> oh, this question. 
<laughs> oh boy, maybe I should have went number two. Maybe uh, I should have went three. I don't uh, know. No, no. Uh, <laughs> oh, Jesus, would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or one hundred duck-sized horses, and why? <laughs> One horse-sized duck. That's a big duck. Or, or, what, or what else? What was uh, the other one? Jeez. Uh, or 100 so, duck-sized horses. I'm, pro- I'm probably getting whipped either which way, so I guess I'm just going with the one so I can make it make it fast and not get 100 tramplings along the way. So, yeah, definitely definitely one horse-sized duck. <laughs> that is probably one of the, the, the most – outrageous questions we've asked on our show and i think it's absolutely hilarious uh, well, that's the first time i've ever been asked that i mean right. i've never even thought about that before so yeah <laughs> good random question i didn't even come up with the questions that's the best part so uh <laughs> and so so for for scott in case you're wondering he's probably wondering okay well what is what is question number two it's what's the biggest risk that you've taken uh <laughs> so we'll ask that one just for scott's sake yeah, well, I mean th- that one is uh, it's 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 a common one. Anyone that's ever went into business, I mean it's a it's a huge risk. In fact, uh, I had a very steady job. You know, I was making at the time it was a very nice salary, very predictable, and we lived very comfortably on that. And I remember going to my wife saying, "Hey, I, I think I'm gonna start a new. I'm gonna start this company up. Here's the thing. I don't know if we can ma- pay ourselves. I don't I don't know. So I and, and she trusted me enough to to let us run with that. And it was rough. That first year, I paid myself twenty five thousand mm. uh, dollars, and, and it was a big, a big uh, cut. But the risk paid off in the long run, right? right? So, yeah, yeah, definitely the biggest risk going into business. Well, it's a it's a massive risk. Um, yeah. No, I think back to like going into business for myself, too big risk um, when I did it, and glad that I did because, well, I mean. I, uh, yeah, it's, it's always, it's always something that's risky. And actually I was, I was, uh, texting a friend and he's like, thanks for the mentorship. I went out and I finally, he's like, I just, I decided to quit my job. I don't know if he's actually quit his job or not, but, uh, he might still be doing it, but he's like, I just, I finally, I stopped getting lost in analysis paralysis Yeah, and I got my first client, uh, for what he's trying to build for his business. Uh, and it's in, those are those things when you just stop waiting until perfect. Yeah. Cause perfect will never come. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Um, so at one topic, and I, I'm going to squirrel a little bit from what I wanted to get into in like the data and consumer sentimentism, uh, but you had mentioned earlier that the journey of selling the business, growing and then selling the business and the emotional ride that went into that when you sold. I think a lot of people don't understand the mental anguish uh, that happens at either A, time of sale, B, during the sale, or C, when it finally closes and you're done. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All of them. Well, well, yeah. let's let's talk about them because I think that's that's something that often gets overlooked. Yeah. So, so the first part of it, uh, I was lucky enough to have several mentors that had built and sold businesses. So, and and they were wise enough to tell me, hey, here's the level you need to get at before you can even entertain it. And and I got to see why that was even something I wanted to do. You know, I was looking at, I was working very hard. Uh, and we lived comfortably, right? But I was looking at some of these other people uh, in the industry, like Ken Goodrich and Ben Stark, and several of these other people that I really looked up to. That man, they had some uncommon wealth, you know, that that wasn't very common at, at the time, especially if you're pre 2018 when this mass exodus, you know, had not begun yet. Um, so learning from them, I saw, wow, this is a shot to do something really special and, you know, create kind of a generational wealth. And, and I learned about selling the business multiple times through a private equity uh, sponsored deal and how that worked. Before I had no clue. You know, I thought you sold a business, you walked and that was it. No, now you can sell, you can uh, help the private equity group keep growing. They sell it again. It could happen again. You know I mean? Uh, numerous different times, you know, and then what that can mean for your, your, your other team members. So the decision to sell is, is very hard. And then the next part of it is you get up to the finish line. Uh, and now you're, you're, you're committed to the sale. You've went through due diligence. You're almost to the point of just like, just get this thing done, you know, and so many deals fall apart and that, and it is so hard on business owners. In fact, one time I had a couple deals fall apart before we actually did it. And I just remember thinking, Oh my gosh, you know, what in the world is, do I even want to uh, tempt this again? You know, is it worth it? Mm. Cause that due diligence is tough. 
And all the time you got to keep your company running very strong because they're looking at the trailing 12 months, you know, and if you slip, then a uh, deal's off, you know, sorry, we're, we're not going to end up doing this thing until you show us you can improve back. So getting to the finish line is, is a big deal. Uh, and then there's this, uh, after you close this sense of, uh, oh my, wow, I did it. This is awesome. And then quickly followed up the next day when you woke up like, well, okay, nothing's really any, any different. Yeah. Your, your, your bank account may look a little different, but nothing really, uh, changed. So there, mm -hmm. there's this roller coaster of, you know, uh, uh, excitement. And, and then all of a sudden, like now what? And then for a lot of people, they're they're staying on with the business. So now think about what they've just done. They've just sold a company. Yeah, they got the financial security, the 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 safety net back there. Now, if they're invested in keep growing the company and they're still got a lot of energy, this is great. Now they can take more risk. They got more capital. The private equity, uh, you know, sponsorship or whatever can help uh, help them grow to do even more. But if if they weren't really uh, in it for the long haul like that, now they've just got themselves a job. You mm -hmm. know, now they got uh, I remember the first real realization that, uh oh, I, I remember my new employment contract for staying on at Hunter. And it said something about my two week vacation. And I was like, oh, man, I've been taking, you know, six vacations a year I, I, with my family at different times, all while I run the business remotely, you know, so it wasn't that big deal. But but it was like, wow, now you've got someone to answer to. So it's a little bit different of a role, regardless what they say. Uh, and it's not bad. It's just different. Someone needs to be prepared if they're if they're going to stay on their company. Mm -hmm. um, be prepared. You've got a job now and you still have to perform. It's not all, uh, you know, go live your dream life type of thing. Right. And that's what I was signed up to do. I really I was going to stay on with Hunter and keep growing the company. And uh, and I would still be there today. God had a little bit different plans for me though. And, uh, and I had a, I got wiped out, man. I got this major illness, took me out a whole year in 2019. And when it took me out, my team did a really great job of stepping up and they ran the company and I consulted with the private equity group. And I'm like, look, I'm bad. I don't, I don't even know if I'm gonna make it out of this thing. I think you need to go hire a new GM to come in and, and run this Oklahoma and Texas area. And they did, uh, Thank God. Fast forward, uh, you know, several months after I got healed up, I was back. OK. And then once then, though, I looked, I'm like, I'd be doing a disservice if I went back in now after they have brought new people in. People have stepped up. They're doing fine. So it released me, you know, so I got to be released, which that was a whole other feeling like, OK, I had my whole identity in this business. You know, I mean, essentially, whether I, I, I want to claim that or not. I mean, that's essentially the mm -hmm. truth. I mean, me and my wife, my family, we were all in it, uh, in this small town and, uh, and everywhere we went, people knew us as, you know, the, the, Oh, there's hunters from, you know, the heat and air place. And, and that was gone. So then what, you know, then what do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, you can go and, uh, you know, do your hobbies and such, but I, I think there's still part of us that wants to create and cultivate and grow um, that whole part of it. So if anybody sells a business and is going, planning to actually exit, I, I highly recommend uh, keeping your options open or be thinking about what's next, because if you don't, you're, you're going to, you're going to find yourself kind of lost. And then uh, what do I do? You know, type of thing. And then Ron Smith, uh, you know, God rest his soul, phenomenal mentor wrote, wrote the book HVAC spells wealth, which was a big help to me. But I saw him one time and he's like, Chris, you know, after you sell a company, you're probably going to have to move. I'm like, move? Why? And he said, well, Chris, when I sold Modern Air down in Florida, he said, everywhere I went, everywhere I went, people still said uh, either Ron, boy, it's sure not like it used to be, or they were still wanting me to come and do stuff for him. He mm. said, I couldn't go to Walmart. I couldn't go anywhere. And he said, it just, it was too much. It was like a continually dragging you back in mentally into this this realm of something you can't control anymore uh, so he said he relocated so me and my family did we relocated to, to texas and and we also have a place in florida now but um and that was honestly a pretty good decision i loved the town that i was at there's a lot of people i think even watching on this thing from that area but beautiful place 
But I tell you, anytime I go back, I still get those questions like, man, it's not the same or, uh, or can you believe they do this now or this, or, you know, it's just, it, it never ends. So a business owner really has to be prepared for, for that, uh, to happen in their mind or otherwise they're going to, they're going to find themselves just in a, in a state of always turmoil. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and even though you may have the money in the bank, um, if you're not settled mentally and, and, uh, it's, it's just not, not great. You know, that type of deal. Well, uh, there's a, there's a lot to unpack, uh, from, from that. I mean, it's like, I'm it's like, do I want to go back to the very beginning? And like, Hey, the question is like, how do you know when, when to sell? Right. I mean, that's, that's yeah. one thing. Right. And, but then also these other factors that I think really relate into that question. Cause I wrote that down when you first started talking, like, how do you know when to sell? But now you've got to factor in all these other things on that. Um, I think one thing that um, that wasn't in there um, is what Scott said, uh, man, for me to be employees, I would fear that they may not be taken care of. And that's yeah. also a good realization too, to say, okay, well, when I sell, what's going to happen to my team? Are there yeah. going to be layoffs? Are they going to shift into that? And you're like, depending on who you're selling to, yeah, that might happen. You go to private equity and you, let's say you have a, a, a CFO inside your business. Well, if you sell a private equity, guess what? They probably already have a CFO. They probably yeah. don't need your CFO. So that person might be out of work, right? And so it's those extra things about your people that sometimes people don't necessarily think about. Well, here, here's the thing with the people. This is where you have a lot of control before you sign sign any deal. So for me, my team was, was so important to me. I wanted to make sure, hey, is this going to be good for them? Uh, so, so number one, we looked at all what we were able to give them. Versus once we partnered with uh, the private equity, their insurance cost halved. You know, I mean, automatically there was a huge win. Uh, there was more uh, room for expansion, sure enough, um, and growth, sure enough. Several people have even left my company, went to work for the, the parent company in training roles and other, other things out there. And then the last part, it was financial. So for me, I, I negotiated in, I actually gave part of, of the sum of money that I got, a pretty significant sum. To, to four key people in the business. And then I negotiated for another eight people to have equity in the new company going forward. Mm. So now no longer was it just me, uh, you know, going to financially benefit from this thing. There was 12 other people with an invested stake and ownership stake and seeing it happen. And what happened was two years later, that private equity group resold again. And those four people that I, that I, gifted that to they they become a millionaire out mm -hmm. of that deal and for me that was more uh beneficial and seeing them and then the others they got a pretty significant uh return on investment as well or you know return on their their shares as well and for me that was that was worth more than any extra money that i ever got you know what i mean it's just seeing that and seeing that happen and then after that though th this really goes back to the leadership level and and trust in your team you've empowered them you've trained them hopefully uh you, you've given them the right systems and then releasing them to go be who they can be you know i mean you gotta you gotta turn them loose let them go and uh you know and and then it's kind of exciting watching them and seeing their their wins and their their struggles so i mean even though it, it is hard not want not being back in there with them which i would I, days i would love to then there's other times that i'm like man i love my life right now my goodness, there's no way know how I want back in that, that world. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty satisfying to seeing that, but, but the, the key to that whole thing was your employees negotiate what's going to happen with these employees before you ever sign a deal, yep. you know, and you, you can, you can take care of them if you want to. Yep. And, and a key thing, right. And that's the biggest part. And you, you, there's many different ways that you can, you can negotiate that in. It's a, and the, the key word is negotiate uh, yeah. on it, especially if you've built a business that is acquirable and people want to buy. Now you have power in the negotiations, which is key. Um, let's, let's shift into um, the data that you guys with service Titan, what you do yep. and the, the director of customer experience. Um, I think I got that title, right? I'm hoping well, almost, uh, almost, almost. Well, me... uh, director yeah, of so... customer relations. There we go. I had to flip, over, I flip over to my other side. That's not it. No, no, they should have updated you. So, so I did that for two years. <laughs> and that, that, now I am a, a principal industry advisor. Me right. and Angie Snow. Uh, yeah, is love Angie Snow. Yeah. Yeah. So think about what Service Titan did. They they did something pretty dang unique. 
they they realize they have tons of super smart people that are excellent at building software and growth and all this stuff. And, and then they thought, wow, we need to learn how to really connect with the customer. We got to figure out contractor speak. So they hired Tom Howard uh, to come in and be the VP of customer experience. Mm-hmm. And then Tom said, Hey, we need some, some internal voice of the customers that can be involved with marketing and product and, and at events and studying the data and then telling our team, Hey, what are we building? Is this working? Is it not? Do people really want or need this? So he, he brought a few of us business owners in that like me and Angie, we'd sold the company and we're still looking to, to stay, uh, you know, a worthy cause of mm-hmm. giving back and learning and, and still creating and cultivating, as I said before. So it was, a, it's a perfect role for me. You know, I, I get to, I get to come in, I get to study the best of the best, all the best contractors out there. I get to help the service Titan team build stuff that helps them even faster. Uh, all the while I don't have any stress of, uh, mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, the, the customer side of it that, uh, that a lot of business owners have, but so it, it is a really great role, uh, that I get to do and hats off to service Titan for b- realizing that and bringing in people like us to help them. Well, and the other part is it's, it's plugging in a business owner who's been there, done that in a sense, in in knowing what you need to do to move the needle or not. And, and look, uh, Service Titan is one of the most robust systems out there, and it can get really confusing really quickly if you're not sure what to do inside of it. And look, any CRM is that way. I'm not painting a, a, a you know, the the, the blanket statement that Service Titan is something. No, it's any CRM system, any field service management system can be that way and having somebody that that knows what levers to pull with inside of it is super smart so in terms of the data that you get to see in analyzing some of those sorts of things um and i believe the wording that uh um that you use get a study of the data and see what the best of the best are doing and i think yep. really important in 2024 as well uh, with what's coming up what are some of the things that you're seeing the best of the best doing that others just simply aren't or just not quite there yet yeah so this is a great topic because let's face it it's been a tough uh tough several months span for a lot of contractors yet there's a certain group that are still absolutely killing it and and the the pressure is on for those that aren't uh and if they've sold a business and you know they're and a lot of people that sold after 2018 and, and through the COVID area where 26% growth rate was the industry average, uh, a lot of people came to expect that. They thought that was, let's keep building on that. Well, now things have kind of came back to reality, came back to normal. And I can remember before that where if, if a company was growing year over year by about 10%, that was a pretty healthy growth year, you know, and, and companies were happy with that. We got a little spooled through that, that one splurge there, but so, so I've got a list. I've been trying to figure out and study, Hey, what are these companies that are still growing heavily uh, in the last few months versus these that aren't what, what's the difference? And, and, you know, as much as we'd like to say it's a, it's a specific thing or they've bought this product or this product, it really comes down to the fundamentals And, and it starts with the leadership. Almost all of them have really great leaders that care about their team and they've they've invested in this, but it's really the execution uh, that sets them apart. So I, I've looked and, you know, the, the companies that are very that have planned, they, they went through a planning exercise. They know to the day how many calls we need to generate today, what the revenue needs to be, uh, how many technicians that's going to take to hit that. So the great companies have all started with a planning process. Um, the ones that I've, I've, I've been studying that they, that's what they've got. They, they knew what they wanted to hit. They were very specific. And then two, they're executing on just the fundamentals. For, for example, I, the other day I had a, a contractor come to, our, come to my house. I bought a house in Florida and you know, when you buy a house, it comes with a home warranty. So, and, and I knew this system was a little bit low. This, this is, this is an example of the lacking of the execution. Okay. So I knew it was a little bit low on refrigerant because I still have gauges. I still remember how to how to check one, but I don't have any other tools. Didn't have any refrigerant. I'm not a, you know a contractor in Florida, so I call the warranty company. I'm like, okay, yeah, send send someone out. Well, they send a pretty large contractor out. You know, this one's in about three states. 
got great notifications when they're coming, all the scheduling thing was really good. But then when it got time, when they come to the house, the technician walks up and I tell him what's going on. And first thing he's like, man, you got three units, but you only bought a, uh, you only put in one work order. So I can only check one. I'm like, well, I'll pay you to look at the other two while you're here. You know, no, I can't do it. So right away, the customer experience, he was like, can't do it. I can only look at this one. It's like, okay, well, look at this one. So he looked at that one and right away he goes, ah, I think I see what the problem is before he even got to it. And not, I'm not letting him know that I may know a thing or two about it, you know? And he's mm -hmm. like, looks like a little oil on the Schrader or on the, on the cap here, probably where your leak is. I'm like, oh yeah. So then he, I said, well, how low is it? So he, he puts his gauges on and anyone that knows anything about refrigerant knows that you have to check the temperature to get the superheat, the subcooling, uh, diagnose the system, not just hook some gauges on and go, yep, it's low. So he puts his gauges on. He's like, yeah, it's probably a little bit low. Um, but here's the thing that the home warranty company, they won't uh, cover any refrigerant. So I'm like, okay, so you know, it's low, but you haven't, haven't really checked anything else. I said, well, how about I just look at a replacement? And he said, well, okay. So he runs to the truck, comes back, throws me out a price for a 14 seer bottom of the, you know, the, the entry level system, uh, right there for, for one system. And I've got three that are all 20 years old, right? One system. And I'm like, well, I'm looking for something a little more efficient. You know, how about something better? Can't do it. No, can't do it. All we get is just this one thing. The, the other ones cause too many issues. Uh, so I, I can't give you one for anything other than this one. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and that was it. The call was done. So I, I think about that and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, here, uh, did, yeah. did I lost out on a three unit sale. Well, I'm begging, you know, I mean, I, I, I would have bought, you know, if they would have done a compelling offer, he didn't look at the inside at all. Didn't do anything like that. But, and this was a reputable company. But I'm thinking about the, the consumer experience now. They expect so much more. Uh, and, and if we're not mm -hmm. executing on the fundamentals, it doesn't matter if you have the best software, whatever. If, if you're not inspecting what you expect in the field, uh, you're, you may be getting lackluster results. And, and here's one thing I highly advocate. I, I did this at Hunter. I did a secret shopper where I had two of my salespeople go to one house. And, and I wanted to see what the result was because they, they both had pretty good closing percentages and one had a little bit higher average ticket than the other. So I wanted to see what, what's going on. But if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have realized that both of them skipped steps in the process, mm -hmm. right? So it was back to me as the leader. I needed to, uh, to reinforce our system, our training to make that happen. And, and, and it opened our eyes to really a couple of minor things that were big deals that I would have never known if we wouldn't have inspected uh, what we expected out of that. So I think of this company, I'm like, if they really knew what was happening out in the field and why their average ticket was so low and why their conversion percentage was so low, they wouldn't just be saying, it's tough times, consumers are rough right now, nobody's right. buying. It wasn't that, mm -hmm. you know? So it's back to basics, honestly, right. uh, is what the best companies are doing. They've got a system, they're executing it, they're measuring it. And uh, they're like I said, they're uh, uh, they're they're what gets measured and recognized gets repeated and improved. That's exactly what they're doing. Yeah, uh, well, you should almost call that company and say, "Hey, by the way, I can uh, offer you some coaching." Uh, I was going, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna reach out to the owner there you uh, go. And, and with him just friendly, but I didn't want to. You know, like, yeah, I don't want, want to say that on the on the podcast. So. Yeah, uh, but but really, I mean, the, the two things is like the planning, right? And, and you mentioned how many daily calls. So like, do you have a daily progress report in your business? Do you measure things on a day by day basis on what you need to know in order to be able to hit your goals and reverse engineering that backwards? And there's plenty of uh, I mean, I'm sure that you guys have it at go time success group. I know a few people that also have those sorts of things in there, but measuring those sorts of things on the planning, but like that back to basics is such a fundamental shift from a lot of people. Right. Yeah. And going back to those basics, it stops and starts. Right. When I like hockey reference, I mean, I'm Canadian. So, of course, I'm going to have a hockey reference on stops and starts. But when you go back to those very basics and you look at the professionals, you look at the pros. And if they're having a tough time in their game, you know what they do? They go back to the very basics. That's it. They don't yeah. work on the extra fluffy things. They go right back to the to the very basics. In yeah. your opinion, on the basics mm -hmm. What, uh, I mean, checklists, et cetera. I mean, maybe we've already answered the question in and of itself, but if you were to pick out one back to basics item 
specifically for 2024 that a business needs to focus on, what would that back to basics be? I, oh, I got it. And I got the data that, that backs it up. If you haven't called into your shop and listened what it's like to try to book a call, please do it today or, or have somebody call and listen. Or, or if you have service time, go back in, pick some random calls that weren't booked and listen to them. So, I mean, the, the industry average, I believe it was like 46% was the call booking rate. So right away, contractors are spending so much money for marketing and throwing everything they can out there and marketers too. They're doing, a lot of them are doing a great job. You guys probably do. And then what happens, it gets to the shop and it's crap and, and it falls through the cracks and, and it shouldn't have to. So if, if you want to improve one thing today, it's nail down this whole CSR, the incoming call thing. The second is a fast follow though. It is a uh, back to the planning part. It's when you know what, how many calls you need to do in a day, if you don't have those calls, guess what? It's time to get busy with the outbounding and do whatever it takes, whether it's the reaching out to past members, people that had open estimates and doing whatever it possibly takes to get your technician back in that home and fill that job board. That's got to be the, the, the second biggest mm -hmm. thing you can do besides shore up your call. Right. Booking. Right. Yeah. And two phenomenal important things. And I'm glad you mentioned that from the marketer standpoint, because nothing frustrates good marketers uh, more than shitty operations. You know, That's if it. We send you hundred leads and you answer 50 of the calls. Well, you've just lost 50 other opportunities because they're not waiting. They're not waiting for a callback, especially yeah. when you think about why they're calling. If you're a plumbing or you're an HVAC, my air condition is broken and it's in Florida or you're in Texas. It's hot. No, nah, I don't want to wait for you to call me back. I want to find something that come out and come out quick, right? If you've, yeah. if you're plumbing and you've got a, a, a backed up sewer, well, they're not calling in, in waiting for you to return back when shit's coming out in their basement, right? Yeah. They're going to be finding somebody quickly to come deal with that, right? Which is a big thing that consumer experience, but that, that other part of the, the back to basics is a huge thing, monitoring the whole customer experience, but outbounding it's this, woe was me attitude and getting rid of it. In fact, if you're, this, if you're like, well, I don't really know where to begin. Hey, guess what? Look in the bottom of the screen, the two sponsors, we did the readouts, elite call and yeah. chirp. They handle that for you. So if you don't know how to do that, then do it. If your back's against the wall, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit there and fold or are you going to actually make a stand? Well, make a stand, dial your, dial your database. That's right? the, that, that's exactly it, man. Yep. And, and so at service time, we have a product it's called second chance leads. Uh, and, and so I, I was on the team kind of looking at it saying, hey, does this thing work? So basically it takes Titan Intelligence or AI and it analyzes all the calls that said, hey, these weren't leads. These weren't any good. And then it, it re-triggers re and classifies it and says, hey, we listened to them. We think these are legitimate leads and we it, it, you should call them back. And what we found is when they take action and call those people back, I don't have the exact stat, but it was it was like mind blowing uh, high how many actually booked after the, these were shoot away, fell through the cracks. AI helped re-identify the opportunity. Someone called them back and they actually booked. Uh, so it, it was just kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, look, look what has fallen through the cracks. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, it's such a good thing to be able to like using AI to see what's falling between the cracks. That's a phenomenal, uh, you know, product right then and then in there of itself, because it just, it's so good because they're, we can only do so much as an individual and we're always going to miss stuff. And so leveraging technology, be able to do that. So, um, hey, Chris, I'm sure we can keep going on and on and on. We're at an hour uh, and I want to yeah. be respectful of your time. So, um, those that have gotten value of this, if you want to reach out, uh, I mean, obviously you can check out service Titan.com. Um, you can reach them if you want to check out go time success group, Chris at go time success group.com is how you can get in touch with him. Uh, you can also ask him service Titan related questions in there. I believe it's C Hunter at service Titan.com. If you want to just go the service Titan route, if you're a service Titan customer, instead of the go time success group. Um, but the other one is go time success group.com is also, uh, open for consulting, uh, through that world and the coaching world of things. So kind of the double edged side of things. So appreciate you taking some time out of your day to chat with us. But before we do, we, before we wrap up though, I do have one final question here for you, Chris. Yeah. What is one question that you wish people would ask you more, but don't. Ah, uh, uh for me, man, uh, it, it would be, uh, um, where do you, uh, what's the question? 
where do you find your your inspiration or your hope at right you know because i i'm a i'm a follower of christ so i i, I wish more people would ask i'd love to tell them about it because that's that's ultimately where i get it what drives me and you know i mentioned that being sick for a year whoo that was an eye opener. Think you're not going to make it. And I tell you what, you look at the world a little bit different and you want to find a way to do things that matter. So that was a, an eye opener for me, really woke me up. But that's one question I wish more people would ask me. Hmm. Well, and you've, you've already answered uh, it itself. And in terms of, and, and I don't know if you want to go go deep on that, I, and I'm remiss for not, for, for kind of glossing over that part of things, but in, in again, without, without going too far into details, I mean, you can share as much as you want. Um, Going from business owner, rocking and rolling, selling the business into the plan to all of a sudden super, uh, you know, sick and questioning whether you're going to make it through it all that, yeah. you know, what, what's that, what was that process like? How'd that, how, what changed for you after that? Oh man, big time change. So, I mean, so one, I just sold the business, right. And I was still continuing on, on top of the world. And then basically got news that, that they thought I had a stage four lung cancer. Wow. It turned out it wasn't. Uh, it was something that uh, I, I could actually cure, but I had eight different tumors in my in my in my chest or tumor like things that ended up being a something called cryptococcus neoformans. But I spent time at the Mayo Clinic and all this stuff. But 2019 pretty much set me on my butt. It took all my energy, made all my adrenals quit, and all this stuff. You know, so when I came out of it, or first whenever I was going through it, and I thought I was going to die because they told me I was. Uh, I had this weird piece, man, because for me as a believer, I knew, okay, if it gets me, I know where I'm going, but if it don't, I'm going to have one heck of a story to tell, uh, when I'm left behind here. So that was it. But then the next part of it is once I was through it, it was like, whoo, near miss. Wow. You know? And so now what, what do I really want out of this life? What do I really enjoy doing? What do I, what can I do that, that is going to, going to actually mean something uh, so, so a lot of people, man, they have this drive in them to go and build and strive and and keep going and keep going and keep going and build two hundred trillion dollar companies, whatever it may be. That's great. Uh, I had that once as well, uh, but I've got this sincere contentment about me after that. And now I want to spend as much time as I can with my family. Mm. I want to do things with them that creates experiences that has fun. I want to find ways to give back to this industry that gave so heavily to me and my, my uh, family and my team. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out how can I do things more in those realms instead of going out and conquering the world and giving all my time and effort to a, to a business growth. Cause we did that, you know I mean? And now we, we have a, we have the safety net, you know, and now it's time to to do things that matter. So that was the biggest thing that whole thing taught me, because I guarantee at the end of your days, we're not going to look back and go, whoo, I wish we'd worked a little bit more. You know, it's right. going to be like, man, I wish I'd loved a little bit more. I wish I would have spent a little more time with with mom or dad or my kids, you know, things like that. So for me, it just reawakened that sense of doing things that matter, you know, right. And, and I think more people need to hear that message, you know, especially because what gets lost is this hustle culture, especially yeah. on social media um, of, you know, I'm proud to work 70, 80, 90 hours per week for my business and I'm building it for my family, but your family never sees you. And what if they didn't want that? Uh, yeah, that's it. And, and right? for some, yeah, I mean, man, for some, uh, having lofty goals is an awesome thing. And I'm not advocating that one shouldn't. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, uh, some of your lofty goals may be to have a, an awesome marriage. I've got an awesome marriage. Me and my wife spend almost every moment of the day with each other. Some people may uh, cringe when they hear that. I don't, I love it. I love, uh, we were high school sweethearts. Mm. You know, I've got four grandkids. We love to go fish, you know? So if I can go out fishing uh, and then still have a, a way to give back like stuff through this podcast or through service Titan helping, it satisfies all my boxes. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm looking to do. Well, and that goes almost full circle right to the very beginning of the higher why and the purpose, right? That's it, man. Right. Yeah. And now it's your own individual higher why. I mean, I guess the number two one is your dreams and your vision, right? So, um, super, super impressive stuff. Thank you for um, all of your contributions into the industry and for that recognition through that tough time in 2019, because I think the value that you bring is tremendous. Uh, and thank you for continuing to show up to help contractors. So, uh, I and thank appreciate you, it, yeah. And thank you for being on the podcast and dropping some absolute knowledge it was great all right thanks awesome. again norris and until next time folks cheers cheers
Well, that's a wrap on another episode of HVAC Success Secrets Revealed. Before you go, two quick things. First off, join our Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash HVAC Revealed. The other thing, if you took one tiny bit of information out of this show, no matter how big, no matter how small, all we ask is for you to introduce this to one person in your contacts list. That's it. That's all. One person. So they too can unleash the ultimate HVAC business. Until next time. Cheers.